gamma uh, to the D, where gamma is strictly less than lambda. Okay, so that's that's what the, our first result, which is a uh, uh, crucial. And now, if we take a correct match, then uh, we know that there is uh, the neighborhood of that correct match in the intersection tree that will be a tree common to the two neighborhoods. And so this tree common to the two neighborhoods is uh, uh, in distribution close to a Galton-Watson branching process with a, a, a Poisson a number of offsprings with parameter lambda times s. That's the, because the intersection graph is an Erdos Schrödinger graph with a parameter uh, average degree lambda times s. So if we uh, pick lambda times s larger than this gamma thing, then we are good because uh, for a correct match, we know that uh, we tend to get a matching weight that is of order lambda s times uh, to the power d. Whereas if we pick two nodes that are far apart, we tend to get matching weight that is gamma to the D for a, a gamma strictly less than a lambda times S. So that's how we carve this uh, little triangle in the, um, in the phase uh, uh, space. So, uh, okay. Uh, so I guess these slides show more or less what I was uh, telling. Uh, so uh, we, we have managed to improve this scheme. So I, I wanted to describe it because uh, it, uh, uh, the, the ideas come needed in, in its analysis, uh, they, they can be boosted. And so we can construct better schemes. And uh, now we have a, a better understanding of a, a, a large region of the phase uh, phase uh, space for which polynomial time uh, alignment is feasible. So let me not dwell on the uh, numerical experiments for that, uh, that scheme. So I'll, uh, I'll now uh, discuss uh, uh, more recent results we obtained and uh, where we stand, okay? So um, I'll first tell you about some results we obtained uh, with Mark and uh, Luca uh, this year. Uh, so, uh, uh, remember, in the tree matching weight algorithm, we, uh, we have to uh, compare two uh, cases. Uh, the case where we have uh, the neighborhoods corresponding to an exact match. So what we tend to get is, uh, if, if we uh, remember the construction of the uh, two uh, graphs, we, uh, we get two correlated trees. And how are they constructed? So. Uh, you uh, you can uh, <coughs> you can start from uh, so you can start from a, 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 a root node. Then you sample a Poisson of lambda s uh, children in both of them, and then uh, you have an extra number of uh, neighbors you'll get that is going to be Poisson of lambda one minus s. Okay and uh, here as well, independently. Okay. And so uh, you uh, have uh, this structure for the two uh, neighborhoods. That's when you have a correct match. So, uh, and you, you know uh, how to pursue uh, uh, the construction of the correlated neighborhoods. So eventually you'll have uh, a tree of uh, that will appear in the two uh, in the two uh, uh, neighborhoods. That is going to be a Galton-Watson branching tree with uh, a spring distribution Poisson of lambda times s. Okay, uh, and this gets augmented uh, independently in the two cases. So uh, how is that augmented? So well each node in the intersection tree gets an additional number of children that is a Poisson lambda one minus S independently in the two trees. And the uh, new vertices we add, they get a, a descendants that is a, a, a branching process that is a Poisson with a, a parameter lambda. So that's, uh, okay, we get a Galton Watson of Poisson of lambda here. And likewise for all the other uh, nodes. So we know that's the, 
joint distribution of the neighborhoods of two nodes that are an actual match. And so that's one situation. The other situation is two nodes that are far apart in the uh, uh, master graph uh, for which the neighborhoods are independent. Okay. Uh, and so we have uh, two uh, Poisson lambda uh, branching processes. So what we did in this tree matching weight algorithm, we, we tried to distinguish between the two situations and we had one statistic to distinguish which was this tree matching weight. Actually, we can ask for the best statistic there is to distinguish between these two situations. Uh, so this is a hypothesis testing problem, in fact, that we have to uh, solve. Uh, we, we must distinguish between two hypotheses, whether the two neighborhoods are from this correlated distribution or they are independent uh, branching processes. So once you view it like that, well, you uh, go back to uh, hypothesis testing theory and you have this uh, neyman person lemma from the uh, early uh, 20th century. And you know exactly what is the best test uh, that there is. I mean, um, you say the Neyman, this um, this classical result that I should know, then I don't uh, remember this this criterion. The uh, Neyman Pearson, Neyman -Pearson yeah, lemma. If, if if it's not too long. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Neyman Pearson lemma. Uh, <coughs> Neyman Pearson lemma is the following thing. So you have, uh, you observe X and under H0, X follows distribution P naught. Under H1, X follows distribution P1. Okay, so what you're interested in is <coughs> you'd like to uh, maximize, so you construct a test T of x, and when T of x is uh, zero, that means you believe you are under uh, assumption H naught. If T of x equals one, you believe you are under assumption uh, H1. And so your test uh, should minimize uh, the errors that you can make. So you have two uh, kinds of errors, uh, errors of the first kind and of the second kind. So you want to maximize <coughs> Uh, uh, P1, that T1 of X equals one. So that's uh, the probability of uh, correctly detecting that you are under the alternative hypothesis H1. Uh, but, uh, okay, if you take it uh, always equals to, to one, you have something meaningless. So typically you try to do that under a constraint that uh, P0, T1 of X equals one, is less than some uh, threshold, okay? So to uh, uh, strike a, a, um, a balance between the, the two types of errors you can make. So neyman pearson lemma tells you that essentially uh, the optimal test is of the form uh, T1 of X equals one if and only if P1 of x over P0 of x is above some threshold. So that's it's the, the actual statement says a bit what you should do when you are exactly at the threshold, but uh, essentially this is that. So the best test that there is uh, just considers the likelihood ratio between the two distribution, decides uh, for the alternative distribution if the likelihood ratio is above a threshold decides for the null hypothesis H not if you are below this threshold. This threshold is uh, a functional of P0 and P1. Uh, you can construct it explicitly. Uh, it's, it's a function of this alpha, this trade-off right. parameter that you have chosen. So okay. you pick alpha, then uh, it will force a value for the threshold term. Ah, okay. For, for a given P1 and, and P0 that you know, and given yes. alpha, there is a there is a constructive way to get this threshold. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. You can look at the uh, cumulative distribution function of the likelihood ratio under P naught, and so ah, that yes, will okay. give you yes. how to choose tau uh, as a function yes, of, of alpha. Okay. Uh, 
And uh, there are some cases where you have jumps, and so you need to randomize where you are at a jump point. But uh, that's that's a detail. Okay, so we know we have this lemma, so we know we should not do this tree matching weight thing. Actually, we should uh, face the distribution of these pairs of trees, whether independent or whether correlated, and do the likelihood ratio computation, and then uh, uh, decide whether to. Uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, put the two nodes uh, as a candidate match or not based on the value of the uh, likelihood ratio. Okay, so um, okay, so I guess that's uh, that's essentially what it says here. So we'll uh, limit our observations of neighborhoods to some depth parameter. We'll uh, uh, take the uh, two neighborhoods if they are tree-like. Uh, we'll uh, leave aside the neighborhoods where you find loops uh, in your graphs. So if they are tree-like, you will compute the likelihood ratio of the pairs of trees that you get uh, under the two distributions, the distribution of correlated trees and the distribution of independent trees. And you'll uh, uh, put the, pair, the matched pair in your set of candidate matches if, uh, if this is above a threshold, okay? So uh, it turns out that uh, this likelihood ratio of the distributions of pairs of trees, you can compute in a recursive manner. I mean, those uh, branching processes uh, are constructed in a recursive way, and you can compute uh, all kinds of quantities of interest on such branching processes in a recursive way. And it, it is the case here, uh, it's, a, it's a nice exercise actually, that you can compute uh, recursively the likelihood ratio. So that's good uh, for algorithmic uh, purposes because uh, we can implement a test of that kind. We can, uh, uh, the way you would do it is you would start off with depth one and compute uh, likelihood uh, ratios. So you would uh, remember we'll use dongling uh, <coughs> trees. So uh, for ij, then we look at uh, depth one here, and then we have u uh, v. We have dangling uh, <coughs> dangling tree of depth one there, and so we'll compute the likelihood ratio for this pair of trees uh, under the two hypotheses, and then we'll uh, keep increasing the depth. And we'll use an induction formula, which will allow us to compute the uh, likelihood ratio when we observe at depth uh, D from the likelihood ratios when we observe at depth D minus one. Okay, so it turns out this is a polynomial time scheme, uh, but it's, it takes some work to, to establish it, but it is a polynomial time scheme, okay? Uh, so let me not uh, dwell on the recursive formula for the likelihood ratio. We just need to know it can be computed. And so, um, and so, uh, okay. So with, uh, once we have this uh, uh, angle of attack uh, in mind for this problem of aligning trees, we can do some, uh, uh, some analysis. So I, I'll not give many details. Huh? I don't know how much time I, I have, 20 minutes, so I, yeah, okay. So I, I'll, I'll be uh, sketchier and sketchier as I, as I uh, uh, go on. So uh, have I, uh, okay, I, I went too fast. Okay, so we, we have one notion that is important for us uh, for uh, analyzing uh, the, the scheme that we will produce. This is the notion of a one-sided detection. So we have those two hypotheses, whether the two trees are correlated or whether they are independent. And we'll say that we have a, a, a one-sided detection in this uh, hypothesis testing problem if we have a, a family of tests indexed by the depth at which we uh, uh, consider our trees, such that uh, the probability of correctly guessing the alternative uh, hypothesis when it is true does not go to zero asymptotically as the depth goes to infinity. So we, we catch some correlated pairs, okay? No, we don't miss out all the correlated pairs. That's what it will mean. 
but uh, we never uh, uh, wrongly classify uh, uh, as a candidate correlated pair some uh, pairs that are not correlated. So the probability under the uncorrelated distribution of uh, <coughs> deciding that we have something that is uncorrelated goes to one. The depth uh, goes to uh, infinity. So that's that's a definition. That's a property that we would like to have. Okay. And so uh, we, we can characterize when this holds for this uh, hypothesis testing problem. Uh, this holds precisely when the Kullback Leibler divergence between the distributions of the correlated trees observed to depth D and the uncorrelated trees observed to depth D, when this Kullback Leibler divergence goes to infinity as D goes to infinity, then we have this one sided detection property. And uh, um, uh, okay, so uh, in order to uh, you know progress on our understanding of this uh, phase diagram that I was drawing here, I have this uh, tiny triangle here. Uh, we we can fill out a larger region, uh, any region where we know that we have one-sided detection for this hypothesis testing problem. We know that the uh, uh, algorithm based on computing likelihood ratios using thresholds, etc., will uh, produce a, 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 a non-vanishing overlap uh, whenever we have one side detection. So now the work has been reduced to computing uh, the, or to controlling the pullback Leibler divergence in a hypothesis problem between pairs of trees. Distributions, but why then in the definition of one-sided bounds you needed the probability to uh, instead of false positive to be zero because as if you if you why did you need that? Uh, because if you think of the graph matching problem, we know there are exactly uh, n correct correspondences. So mm -hmm. for each node of the n nodes in the uh, First graph, there is only one good match, uh, whereas there are uh, other n wrong matches. So we okay. have uh, uh, other n squared false matches that we need to rule out. Okay, okay. Okay. And so if we want to produce a, a, a non vanishing overlap, we, we need a, a strong control on the number of uh, see, false positives that we, we produce. So this is why we, we uh, crafted this definition. Okay. It's good. Okay, uh, so, um, so now the game is to uh, figure out under what uh, values of lambda and s we have divergence to infinity of the scale divergence uh, as uh, d goes to infinity. So, uh, I mean, in the, in the paper I, I was uh, quoting with Mark and Luca, we came up with a, a number of sufficient conditions for uh, divergence to infinity of this Kullback uh, Leibler divergence. So here's one particular, uh, uh, well, th this is just a, a, a low, uh, lower bound, but uh, okay, here's one, uh, uh, one sufficient condition for divergence. I, I mean, there's, I guess, nothing for you to glean from the uh, formula, but it's, it's just one that can be shown reasonably quickly uh, based on the recursive uh, expression for the likelihood ratios. And so using such arguments, we know that this triangle was a pessimistic region, you can enlarge it. And so uh, we know that there is actually a, a larger portion. Uh, but so the, the, okay, maybe I'll jump to what we know now. Okay, so uh, uh, recently we started uh, collaborating with Guillaume Semergeon on this problem who did amazing computations. And so now we have, uh, a much better understanding of when this uh, correlation tree based uh, uh, correl correlation detection in trees uh, approach uh, succeeds. Okay. And so, um, uh, okay, okay. Uh, I think I, I should not try to say too much about the, well, let, okay. Let me try. So, uh, I've, I've skipped many details. Uh, there are several ways in which you can describe those trees. Uh, so we are dealing with rooted trees. 
there's one way which is quite natural, which is to uh, assume you label in some order the children of each node. So this is a, a representation in terms of labeled trees. Okay. Uh, and uh, I did not mention it, but this is how we approach the problem initially. And so uh, when we observe uh, the neighborhoods of nodes in, in uh, graphs, there's no uh, intrinsic notion of an order of the children or of the neighbors. So what we do is we assume we uh, label them uniformly at random. So we uh, worked on that. And so the uh, expressions I wrote for the likelihood ratio uh, were based on this uh, representation. Okay, uh, so that, that got us that far. Uh, but actually, we are dealing with unlabeled trees. Okay, so uh, tree, rooted trees that are labeled, but uh, changing the labels would make them identical. They are isomorphic, and we are dealing with classes in this uh, uh, in this uh, equivalence relation. So we are dealing with unlabeled rooted trees. Uh, and so, um, what what we wanted to understand in particular is uh, how does this region behave? as lambda becomes large. Uh, and uh, um, if I look at uh, uh, neighborhoods uh, to depth one, so I have one node here, I have uh, uh, here Poisson of uh, lambda s, that is a common number of nodes in the two, uh, in the two graphs, and then I add uh, Poisson of lambda one minus s. Okay, so when lambda becomes large, uh, I can uh, subtract, so a tree to depth one is just a number, it's a number of children. Okay, so I can subtract the, the, its average, I can rescale it, and when lambda becomes large, I know that this uh, properly rescaled will admit a Gaussian limit. Okay, that's just the central limit theorem. And I know that under the correlated model, after proper centering and rescaling, instead of having two independent Gaussians, I'll have two correlated Gaussians. The parameter S will show up uh, in the uh, correlation of the uh, two Gaussian random variables. And so uh, what we did with uh, Guillem is push uh, this uh, idea of uh, their existing uh, Gaussian limit uh, to arbitrary uh, depth D, and which allowed us to uh, understand exactly how this uh, region uh, uh, behaves as uh, lambda is large. And so, um, well, to get a Gaussian limit, uh, you want to apply centering and rescaling, so you'd better be in a, a vector space to rescale things, uh, subtract things, so it's, it's, it will be helpful. Uh, it turns out that uh, uh, unlabeled trees, they can be seen as objects in a vector space. Uh, so for instance, uh, uh, an unlabeled root tree of uh, depth D, you can view that as a counting measure of uh, an uh, unlabeled rooted tree of depth at most D minus one. So, you know, you have the space of a tree of depth d minus one, each of the children of your root, uh, which has as its downstream tree of uh, depth at most d minus one, then a uh, particular tree, you put a, a Dirac mass for the corresponding object. You do that for all the children. And so that's a, a, an equivalent uh, way to, to uh, consider unlabeled rooted trees. So we are in a vector space, okay, Me uh, measures, we can add measures, we can uh, multiply measures. Uh, and so th that's actually the right way to consider this hypothesis testing problem. And using this, uh, we can actually show that uh, for uh, our joint distribution of trees, uh, if we let lambda go to infinity, there is a Gaussian limit. We can, uh, it's a, it's a delicate operation, but we can center and rescale the measures that stem from those unlabeled trees. And we get uh, limiting objects that have a Gaussian distribution in an infinite dimensional space, but a vector space. And we can also compute the KL divergence for the limit, the Gaussian limit. And we can also uh, show some continuity that as lambda goes to infinity, the 
KL divergence we are interested in will converge to the uh, KL divergence in the Gaussian limit for which we have an expression. So putting all this together, uh, we get, uh, 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 okay, what have I? Uh, all right, so, uh, <clears throat> okay, so maybe let, let me uh, stick to the slides. So wh what do we know about the uh, limiting Gaussian objects? Okay, so uh, the KL divergence for the limiting Gaussian objects uh, diverges to infinity as the depth goes to infinity if S, the correlation parameter, is larger than the square root of a constant alpha that is known as the Otter constant. That's uh, 19th century mathematics. Otter uh, uh, worked on uh, combinatorics of counting the number of trees, uh, rooted uh, trees unlabeled with a, a given number of nodes. And so this is a, a number which grows exponentially with the number of nodes and the exponent, uh, uh, well, the uh, uh, generating function has a radius of convergence that is this other constant alpha. So that's, uh, we know that for S larger than square root alpha, that is larger than 0.582, uh, the uh, KL divergence in the Gaussian limit blows up, whereas it stays bounded if S is uh, smaller than uh, square root alpha. So eventually what we know uh, today is the following. We know uh, that uh, uh, the region in which this, uh, this uh, approach produces in polynomial time a partial alignment, probably so, uh, <coughs> is uh, a region which as lambda goes to infinity uh, is asymptotic to square root of alpha. So we know exactly the boundary of this domain for large lambda. And we know that this region lies above uh, the, line, uh, 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 the line at square root alpha. Okay, uh, so for uh, lambda large, we know uh, we know reasonably well what goes on. We don't have a, a, an exact characterization of the boundary for any finite uh, lambda, but asymptotically we know where it lies. Okay, so uh, that's where we stand. Uh, and uh, so, and in between, you know that it has to stay above the square root lambda, uh, the square root alpha, because. Uh, because we have, uh, uh, we, we know that the KL divergence uh, in the uh, 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 original model converges to the KL divergence in the Gaussian model, but we know it is bounded by a quantity uh, okay, that okay. stems from the Gaussian model, and this quantity does not diverge if we are below. Okay. So we know the KL divergence in our original model can never blow up as, in, as D goes to infinity if we are below this line. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, conclusions. Um, okay, maybe you, you have to catch a bus, right? Okay. Conclude. We, we, I mean, we took yeah. the time enough so that. Uh, okay, okay. So take uh, the time to conclude. Uh, so, uh, as for information theoretic feasibility, as I said, we, we believe that the true uh, condition is lambda s larger than one, but it is still open. So if you. If you are interested, you can try and uh, improve the result of Su, Wu, and Yu from uh, lambda s larger than four to lambda s larger than one. So that's that's an open question. Uh, okay, uh, we are trying to uh, uh, understand even better this region where this uh, uh, algorithm I, I described based on likelihood ratios succeeds. Uh, but we have now a good understanding and these Gaussian limits that I, I mentioned uh, are really a, a, a good way to, to learn more about this. But uh, okay, we are trying to improve uh, our understanding of what happens for finite lambda. So you, you conjecture that your algorithm is optimal in this intermediate region? Uh, so uh, yes, I guess that's my, uh, that's my third point. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> We did conjecture that uh, when it would fail, uh, it would not be polynomial time feasible to achieve a partial alignment, but we don't have a strong, uh, strong argument for that. So this is a, a gut feeling or something like that. So, uh, but that's completely open, showing that uh, no uh, polynomial time algorithm can succeed in a region. This is, this is okay, we will never, oh, we, we can't do that in general. What 
could be done though is to show that if you limit yourself to a family of algorithms, say uh, you have those low degree polynomials that you can construct from the observations, if you limit yourself to a family of, of, uh, uh, of uh, estimators, maybe uh, they are not powerful enough in some region. So that, that would be, I guess, one way to approach that, showing that below this uh, square root alpha line, uh, no uh, algorithm uh, of bounded polynomial degree can succeed, okay, something like that. But this is not done at all, this is totally open. Um, okay, and so, uh, uh, right, so there are open questions as well for the uh, graph clustering in understanding this hard region in showing somehow that a whole class of algorithms uh, will not succeed in the hard region. This is something I think that is quite interesting and that will improve our understanding of what these hard regions are. And uh, uh, okay, and so uh, as a general conclusion, I'll just say that uh, statistical physics brings a rich perspective on computational complexity. I mean, these uh, uh, hard, uh, hard regions, hard phases, this is very intriguing, but this is something I think we have tools to uh, progress on, so better understand, and this is uh, yeah, this is exciting. Okay. Thank you very much. We have time some question no 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 stress we're uh, I, I can't i can't believe that we're actually such uh, in time uh, you use the recursive uh, solution for the uh, generative regular uh, pair of trees to obtain the uh, likelihood parameter l so uh, is there any other uh, solution to solve this uh, problem uh, to achieve the uh, likelihood uh, parameter L or not? Uh, to, you mean to compute this yes, likelihood yes, yes. ratio? Yes, what, what except a uh, re recursive solution. Uh, it has a lot of structure, so we, we could produce several formulas for it. But I think in terms of, of uh, algorithms, mm -hmm. Uh, the recursive formula is the one that uh, is, is the most practical. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, or, or if uh, we consider uh, non-generative trees, uh, is it possible to use uh, the recursive solution again or not? We have to switch off. Uh, so the, the algorithm can be implemented no matter what. I mean, you're given two trees, you can compute a, a likelihood ratio. So mm -hmm. that's not... Uh, the two trees, there's a, a, a value for the likelihood ratio, no matter whether they are sampled from a distribution or another. So that's always uh, doable to implement the algorithm. It, the guarantees we can prove are, are going to be uh, limited to the cases where the trees are sampled from these, uh, uh, well, the graphs are sampled from these correlated error But uh, it is not, uh, it is not uh, possible to use the recursive uh, uh, solution for uh, non-regular trees. Oh, they, they, uh, typically they are not regular. Mm -hmm. Okay, these Galton-Watson branching trees, each time you have a node, you sample at random the number of children and you use Poisson distributions for that. So uh, these are not regular trees at all. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, the number of children does vary from node to node. Thank you. There's a question. Can you speak a little bit about the practical use of these results in the social networks? Like if you manage a social network, what can you do to avoid people uh, making these graph alignments? Thanks. So, uh, what would you do if you find out that you can de-anonymize, uh, say, uh, uh, Twitter it, or... You, uh, you try to align the graphs, and what if you try to prevent that from happening, uh, the reverse problem? Well, yes, okay, so you could say uh, how many fake friends you need to make in the anonymous uh, uh, network, so you want to be below the green region, and maybe we can tell you, okay, uh, here are the parameters, here are the numbers of fake uh, edges you need to create. 
So that, that could be a way, I guess, to, to exploit those results. Uh, uh, I, I, I can also comment on the, the algorithms that have been used typically in order to uh, de-anonymize uh, social network data. They typically uh, start from what they call anchor nodes. So if you know that uh, a guy uh, in that network has this identity in that other one, you have a correct match granted. And so you, you are in a better situation to de-anonymize. So I, I've discussed the case where you don't have those anchor nodes, but in practice, the uh, successful de-anonymizations have always been based on those uh, anchor nodes. So uh, the, the real life situation is, is more complex still. Okay. I think it's time to uh, thank the organizer. Yes. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thanks for uh, thanks to Vianney, Perche, and Sandrine Peche, who unfortunately could, could not be here, but they, they helped greatly uh on many many aspects including uh, financially so thanks to them also i mean uh, ictp staff i didn't mention them but really they did most of the job so <laughs> uh but uh, i mean i had personally a lot of fun and a lot of pleasure this week i really miss that i don't know about you but i mean you forget during these two years that Having this kind of events uh, really changes uh, many things. So thanks for uh, being there and making it uh, happening. Uh, also, I mean, I got tons of new, too many new ideas of new projects. Thanks to this, uh, these great courses. I hope uh, this is the same for you. And uh, so you are uh, always welcome to ICTP to come back. Uh, events are taking place all the time. and. Uh, I can advertise, for example, uh, the Youth in High Dimensions, which is a conference I, I organize with uh, three uh, other friends, which is concerned with a generic, uh, with many fields related in some way or another to high dimensional statistics that goes from statistical mechanics to computer science to mathematics to neuroscience. It's very broad. We give uh, mainly the floor to young researchers PhD students, postdocs, and young faculties. It's a very nice event. Uh, until now, it was um, it was online because of you know what, and uh, it's now starting to take place uh, in a hybrid mode, exactly like uh, like this. It's a bit bigger the size. It's, it will take place in June, but uh, keep it. I mean, keep it in mind for the the next years because it we, we will make it a, a yearly event. So that's one occasion for you to come back here. I hope there will be many others. And so we keep in touch. Thank you very much. <laughs>